Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome everyone that's uh, hooked up on the Internet and, and uh, participating with the Bible study with us tonight. If you'd please rise and we ask God's blessing on the, on the study. Great Father and King, we thank you and praise you for being able to be here tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the Scripture that you've given to us. Uh, you know, many people over the years died just to have a piece of this book, and here we have the whole thing. And uh, with your help and your understanding, your spirit, we can, we can know that this is your divine book that is here for us. So please, Father, open our hearts and minds and inspire what we do this evening, that we can come to a deeper knowledge of what you want us to hear. And I know you say that, you know, these messages to the churches are for everybody to hear. So please open our hearts and minds to the message you have for us this evening. We praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of us were uh, just talking about the map. I haven't had the map up here uh, last time I was, uh, gave a Bible study, but this is very helpful to see how close these, of course, this is now Turkey, modern-day Turkey, but how close these cities were to each other and to realize that uh, probably many of these people didn't meet a lot of the other people in the other churches. The travel time would have just been... People didn't necessarily travel that much. But one thing that's very uh, important when you get to, um, we're going to do Sardis tonight in Philadelphia and Laodicea because this is the, the order of the mail route and it's the order in which the, these uh, uh, churches appear in Revelation. But look how close Colossae is. And the letter to the Colossians is a very important letter and also in relating to what Laodicea was all about. Uh, those churches were actually much closer than any of the other churches. So uh, we have these three left to cover. And of course, as we look at Revelation 2 and 3, and we realize that these were churches that existed when John wrote 95, or around 95, we realize that these churches uh, represent an overall history of the church, the return of Jesus Christ. And these churches represent general attitudes that are in the church at any time. I mean, when you put all these understandings together, we are to study all seven churches. Um, and as we get closer to Laodicea, you know, Laodicea is, is, is going to be a predominant attitude in the church towards the end. Sardis is, a, is an important message to any congregation. And... I want to look at tonight the message of Sardis to any of us, any of us, and the congregations that we're part of. Sardis is an interesting city. You know, when, when, when John wrote, this, this city was probably, the best historians could figure out, already about 700 years old. You figure how long the United States has been around? This city had been around about three times longer when John wrote. Uh, you know, Sardis existed at the time of Cyrus the Great. They had been conquered a number of times. It had actually fended off uh, conquerors on a number of times. Sardis had been famous for generations, for centuries, as an economic powerhouse. Sardis was famous for, as for being a beautiful city. But by the first, end of the first century A.D., it had changed dramatically. It had been on a decades, if not centuries old, decline. Now, this is very important in understanding what happened to the city because the church at Sardis almost reflected what was going on in their city. It was in physical decline. Its superstructure was not, you know, what we would call superstructure of the city was not well kept. It was not the economic powerhouse it had been, but it was a famous city. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I went to visit such and such, a famous city. I got there and I was really disappointed. Everything was run down. You know, it was sort of looked old. Uh, it just wasn't what I thought it would be. Well, if you went to Sardis around the time John wrote to them, you might say, wow, I thought this city was a whole lot better or fancier than this. Uh, it's in decay. It's in decline. Now, Sardis, interesting word, it's actually a plural word. It'd be like Cincinnati's. And the reason why is 
is that the, the original city was built on a 1,500-foot cliff. But as it outgrew the cliff, down below it, another city formed. Now, they were both Sardis, but they were like, in some ways, like two cities, separated by this, this cliff. Uh, and of course, there were roads that went up and kind of connected the two together. But I want you to really think of a decaying city. Now, let's go to the message to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3. Revelation 3. And the angel of the church in Sardis writes. So the messenger that is sent to this church, this is what this messenger is told to write. These things say he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, I don't want to go through a lot of time. We could go through the seven spirits. There are three <laughs> different interpretations of this uh, where people uh, ex- try to explain what they are. Uh, the seven stars is a little easier. Uh, the explanation is in, in, in chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, what's important here about this title, who has the seven spirits and the seven stars, more importantly, like I said, than spending the time, which I don't want to at this point, to try to go through the three different explanations of what the seven, seven spirits are. The point here is that this is a message from the one who directs the churches. This is the direct message from Jesus Christ. That's the point of this title. So the point to me is more important than trying to explain everything at this point. This is directly from the head of the church in Sardis, Jesus Christ. And He says to them, this first statement, you have a name, and He says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. He says, you have a reputation, you have a name. If people would have said, well, have you ever gone to Sardis? Wow. That, now there's a church. There's a dynamic church. They were known as a live and vibrant church. That was, you know, that's what it means. You have a name. That, that you are alive. You have a reputation. He says, but you're dead. So it's very interesting here is that there's a difference between the perception of, say, how the people in Sardis see themselves and even what others may see them, and what they really are in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Now, he says that you are dead, that you're not alive. And the tense there, you know, there's some scholars will say the important thing he's saying here is that you are dying. In other words, you're, you're in the process of dying. And yet you think you're alive. It's interesting, the church at Sardis... Uh, it doesn't say they were persecuted. Remember we went through Smyrna? Persecuted people. Uh, it doesn't say they have the teachings of Jezebel, like Thyatira. It doesn't, they're not accused of some of the things that other churches are accused of. But they're a church that's not alive. Christ isn't in it. The Holy Spirit isn't working in it. They're not truly following and worshiping God but they have a reputation that they are, and they see themselves that they are. And he tells them here a number of things. He says, Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. Now, once again, we get this. These are ready to die. This church feels like it's alive, but it's not. And these things are just, they're ready to die. They're they're, they're just going to fade away. He says, you're ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. He says, so before God, the works of this church, the obedience of this church, the faith of this church, what they produce is not good before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. In other words, the judgment of Christ on this church is when I come, you won't even know I'm coming. His judgment is when I come to judge you, you won't even know I'm coming. 
because you will not be watching. He says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In other words, even inside this group of people in this congregation were some who were still following God, dedicated to God. He says, those people will be with me, but the, the implication is the rest of you will not. So this church is receiving a very, very strong condemnation that the majority of them will not walk with Christ in the resurrection. So this church is in real trouble. He says, he, verse 5, He who overcomes shall be, uh, shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now that's, once again, I won't blot your name out if you overcome. That's a strong implication because if you don't overcome, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to blot your name out. So the condemnation against this church is very, very strong because they are ready to die. But to all looking at them and to themselves, this is the place to be. It's a vibrant church. Now he tells them a number of things. He tells them to be watchful. Okay, now these are five very important things. One is to be watchful. Two, he tells them to strengthen the things that remain. I think that's how you spell strengthen. <laughs> Three, he tells them to remember what you have received and heard. Remember. Obviously, if they have the strength of what remains, they've already lost something, right? Because he didn't say strengthen all that you have. He said strengthen what you have left. So they'd already lost a lot. Then they are to hold fast. And then they are to repent. Okay. So here we have a congregation that are told to do five very specific important things because they must overcome or they're going to be blotted out of the book of life. Of all the churches, this is one of the greatest condemnations of all the churches. How does a church die? I mean, the Sardis church didn't form wanting to die. I'm sure at one time it probably was a very vibrant church. It was an exciting place to be and people followed God. But just like the city around them, they had a big name, but they were dying. To the average member, it didn't seem like they were dying. So what causes a church to die? that the members in the congregation wouldn't even know that they're dying. Well, let's look at some things. First of all, people in a dying church are not spiritually watchful. First thing he told them to do was watch. Okay, Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Verse 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. In other words, it's late at night, but you should be fully clothed with the lights on. Now, that's not what you do usually at night, is it? You take your clothes off and turn the lights out. So he says, okay, you need to be fully clothed and have your lights on. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he shall return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Remember, Christ comes to Sardis, and they're shocked. They don't even know He's coming. 
Here in this parable, he says, we must be prepared, watching, so that we are ready. Now, this has to do with personal preparedness, it's being spiritually prepared for Christ's judgment. If we're walking with God, we are prepared for Christ's judgment, and it's going to be a good judgment. If we're not walking with God, we're not going to be prepared. Blessed are those servants whom the last or when he comes will find watching. That's interesting. They're watching. They're very serious about what they're doing, how they live their lives. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if you come in the second watch or the third watch and find them, so blessed are those servants. In other words, he said, it doesn't matter what time he comes or when he comes. These people are ready and they're waiting. Over the years, I've seen people give up and die in their faith and die in their doctrines and die in their beliefs because, well, Christ didn't come when they wanted Him to. I always tell my kids, you know what? I really believe Christ is coming back in my lifetime, but if He doesn't, probably the last thing I'll say to you to die, before I die is, you better be ready because He's coming. Right? You better be ready. I thought it was my lifetime. It's in yours. So you better be ready. Because that's how we're to live life. In the Sardis church, there was no drive to be ready. Now, it's a very comfortable place, Sardis. Very sort of sleepy place. But it's very comfortable. So comfortable that there's never any growth. Now, a little later here in this same chapter, let's look at verse 41. Peter says to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? He says, well, is this parable just for your disciples? Is it for everybody? He, he couldn't figure it out. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise servant? whom his master will make ruler over his household to give him their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant who his master will find so doing when he comes. So he says, okay, you've got to be watching, and that watchfulness makes you do. This includes watching for the signs of Jesus Christ's return. This isn't just about watching ourselves spiritually. That's part of it. But since this has to do with his return, and the people of Sardis are going to be shocked at his return. The people of Sardis back in 95 were shocked at the judgment that came upon them. Well, what is he talking about? He says, for if that servant says in his heart, this is very important, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink with the drunk. The master of the servant, when he comes on a day that he is not looking for him, and at an hour which is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. In other words, this servant, who is a servant of God, is literally rejected by God because they lost sight of Christ coming and being prepared for Christ. See, it doesn't matter to the people in Sardis in 100 A.D., they had to end their lives, what? Prepared for Christ's return. I mean, if, if, if they say, well, he's not coming, we'll live however we want, they weren't prepared for death, were they? Because when the moment they died, what's their next waking thought? Return of Jesus Christ. So we have to live lives watching for the return of Jesus Christ and the signs and watching and making sure we're prepared. If not, there's two things that happen. One, we begin to fight with fellow servants. One of the things about a dying church is they fight. I don't mean constructive discussion. Or, I mean fight. It says beat, okay? I don't mean disagreements. I mean, you know, I mean beating each other. They beat each other and they participate with the drunkards. In other words, they live... One foot in sin. Sardis would have allowed, there would have been a great 
uncomfortableness with a certain amount of sin among each other. When I'm talking about sin, I'm talking about unrepentant sin. I mean, we all sin, right? But this unrepentant sin that was just sort of accepted. So what is the cure to that problem? Watchful. Okay, we, he gave five cures for something. What I'm going through now is the problems he's saying you have to have a cure for. So he says you've got to be watchful, right? So that's the what, number one problem with a dying church. They are not watchful in terms of their relationship with God, submitting to God's Spirit, being converted. The conversion process has just stopped. And they're not looking for Christ's return. The result is... They beat each other, and they, they allow and participate in all kinds of sin. First problem. Now, the second is people in a dying church, and when you think about this, the, the, these steps become very obvious, okay? You, you, you go from one to the next to the next. The people in a dying church begin to imitate society around them so much that they look just like the society around them. I mean, if you were to get a Sardis, Sardis, they would not have been worshiping Zeus, okay? I'm not saying that. But it wouldn't have been that much different in terms of personal conduct than some of the pagans around them. I'm not saying that these, these people would have promoted adultery, but they would have accepted adultery. They would not have promoted idolatry, but they wouldn't have been real against it either. They exist and they have a name, and they appear to be a live church, but they're really not. And so what happens is they begin to simply decay. Remember, it's a decaying city. This is a decaying church. A decaying church. Everything inside is stuck somehow. There's no growth. There's no vibrancy. They get together every Sabbath and they hear the same sermon they've heard for 25 years. And they say the same things to each other that they've said for 25 years. And they sit down and have the same potluck that they've had for 25 years. And then they say goodbye and they all go home and live the same way they have. In this sort of dead emptiness for maybe 15 years. Somewhere along the way, remember he says, you're ready to die. You're a decaying place. Romans chapter 13. So what do we do, Romans 13, when we find that we are sliding into this, uh, just, just looking like the world? Well, for the first problem is we're not watching. If you're watching, anticipating Christ's return and watching yourself, you can't be doing that. But if that's happening, then there is something you're supposed to do. Romans 13, verse 11. Paul says, And do this, knowing that the time, that now it is not high time to awaken out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He said, remember when you first believed? Remember when you were really awake to discover God's truth? Remember that? When you were on fire to know God's truth. You ever hear the announcer? Well, there's a basketball announcer that says, wow, that guy's playing like his hair's on fire. I've never figured that out, but that's got to be pretty intense. Okay. <laughs> Now, you know, Clay Thornton, he told me today there was a time when his hair did catch on fire. I said, wow, okay, that's pretty impressive. Okay, his hair caught on fire. And he was in a cave. You have to ask him that story, okay. 
Remember when your hair was on fire? Okay. Remember? Paul says to the people in Rome, remember, it's time to wake up. Remember what it was like when you first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. The people at Rome were in danger of sliding into this sinful state. And he says, don't do this. Throw off these works. Remember? He says about Sardis, their works are bad. They're not perfect. They're not good. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. You want to know some of the problems the Roman church had? Well, let's see. Revelry and drunkenness, that's party spirit, partying and drunkenness, lewdness and lust, sexual sins, strife and envy. That's some of the problems they had was partying, drunkenness, sexual problems, uh, strife between members and people being envious. Yeah, sort of like church today. They have some of the same problems. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You know what he's telling these people? They weren't dead. The church at Rome had problems, but it wasn't dead. It was a live church. What he tells them to do, strengthen what you have. The problem with looking like the world is to begin to strengthen what God has given you. Now, when you start looking like the world, start doing what God says to do. Strengthen what you have. Okay, so a dying church is not aware of Christ's return. They're not preparing for Christ's return. So watch. A dying church is sliding into the world. So what do you do? Well, just what Christ told them to do. You strengthen what you do have. Take what you have and at least work off of that. Work off of what you have. Third point about a dying church. People in a dying church forget how God worked in their lives in the past. Going to church is a very social thing. That should be. But in a dying church, that is the primary reason they go to church. It's because it's a social experience. They go to church because it's habit. I remember asking one, or talking to a man one time who had been, who had been a Methodist, and he, he came into the, the church. And I asked him, why did you go to the Methodist church? What did you understand? What motivated you? He said, it's what everybody did. It's what my family did, and it was a habit. I never questioned the habit until something came along and started to say, well, you shouldn't keep Easter. Wait a minute. Or the Bible doesn't really say that. Wait a minute, the Bible doesn't really say that. But he said for, you know, all of his young life, up almost, you know, until his middle age and there somewhere, it was like that was his habit. In a dying church of God, it becomes habit. The Sardis message is important just for us, is also important for us today. A congregation can die for these same reasons. There's no more watching. There's no more strengthening what we have. It's just habit. It's just what we do. We don't think much about it. It's what we've done for so long. Ask most people why they keep Christmas. Well, Jesus was born on that day. And say, well, you know he wasn't born on that day. And they'll say, well, that's true. Then why do you do it? It's what we do. It's what we do. You and I, even with what God has given us, can do this. It's because it's what we do. But it's dead. It's just habit. People in a dying church really like each other. It's mainly why they go. Yeah, I, I find it interesting. Uh, I was reading something. 
Uh, Barclay is a, uh, was a, a Scottish um, commentator, and he, he writes real well. And I get a kick out of what he writes sometimes. And he made a comment about the, the Sardis church. He says, you know, they're not accused of a specific heresy. He says, there wasn't enough energy in this church to produce a heresy. <laughs> it would be different than what they did. <laughs> oh, we don't do that. Of course, the problem is they wouldn't even know if it was a truth. Oh, no, we don't do that. That's not what we do here. But it's the truth. Nope, that's not what we do here. As that happened, they lost more and more and more until Christ finally says, just take what you have that's left and let's just work on that. Let's just build up strength in that. But then we get to this place where they forget how God has worked in their lives. Dying churches then become, it becomes almost impossible for them to become relevant to people outside their little group. A new person walks in and the new person doesn't understand the in-speak because they talk the same way they did 40 years ago and there's no other way to say something. Language changes, right? Gay doesn't mean what it did to my grandmother. So you can imagine walking into a church where everybody walks up and says, oh, did you have a gay week? Uh, you know, you understand what I'm saying. You, you have to understand that we don't live in a static world. In a dying church, it's static, completely static. Now that, the problem is they gave up the truth in this staticness, or parts of the truth, not all of it. And so it's hard for a dying church to become relevant to anything outside of themselves. The purpose of the congregation is to serve me. Because every Sabbath, we get fried chicken. Because we've had fried chicken after services every Sabbath for 32 years. And if we don't have fried chicken this Sabbath... It probably means there's some heresy coming on. <laughs> now I'm exaggerating a little. Okay. The problem with a dying church is that they're so comfortable with their decay. I, I read an interesting article, a couple articles, about people who go to dying Protestant churches. Okay, now we're not talking about our teachings or our experiences, but dying Protestant churches. And what are the symptoms of dying churches? Because Protestant churches are dying all over the country, just dying, shutting down. And one of them is that everybody, all the money is spent on the building, but the building is decaying. But nobody notices that it smells bad anymore. And the reason nobody knows is because it started smell, smelling bad in 1987. And they don't notice. But all their money, all their discussion was how to fix up the building. Put up flowers or do this or do that, but they don't realize. Now remember, Sardis is in a decaying city. <laughs> if you're the average person in Sardis, it was, they're probably pretty proud of their ancient, very well-known, very rich city. But it was decaying. Their congregation was decaying, and they could not see it. Decaying churches try so hard. They either go usually from one extreme to the other. One is, we've done it this way forever, we're never going to change. On, we're going to have fried chicken every week. Or the other is, we've got to change everything to bring in young people. Either way, you have a generation-centric church. God's church is not a generation-centric church. It is a God-centric church that is based on building the family of God. Now, if anybody can tell me which age is more important in a family or which age is not important in a family. So to create generation-centric churches 
This is what God wants. He wants churches to be centered around Him in which everybody is involved in one way or another. So you do have different projects for different peoples and different maybe demographics or different, different ages, but it's, it's, it's the center isn't. Well, we're, everything in our church is centered around um, senior citizens. That's not good. Well, everything in our church is centered around children. That's not good. You should have projects for everybody, but what is the purpose? To create a family. It's hard for a dying church to see that. Dying churches seldom train new people or new leaders. Uh, and they begin to dilute doctrines in order to attract new people. But nobody comes anyways. God's not going to bless churches that begin to dilute the basic teachings, the core teachings. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at where the writer of Hebrews deals with this very problem and what he tells them to do. Dying churches are not watchful. Dying churches can't, they need to strengthen what they have to begin with, then work on rebuilding the church. But you've got to strengthen what you have that is right. Hebrews 10, 32. Hebrews 10, 32. He says, but recall, now here's some encouragement from, I think Paul wrote Hebrews, but here's some encouragement from the writer of Hebrews to the church. But recall the former days in which you were illuminated. You endured a great struggle with sufferings. Remember what you were willing to do to obey God. You now I have conversations all the time with people. We talk about sometimes how unbalanced the church was in the 60s and how unbalanced the church was in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and today. <laughs> but for some of you that were around, there was also... A commitment to God sometimes 40 years ago that was absolutely remarkable. And here he tells a group of older people, remember what you were willing to do to follow God. He says, partly while you were made a uh, spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions for those who were treated. So treat, he says, sometimes you suffered, sometimes it wasn't you, it's because you now made new friends and they suffered. You know, you, you come into the church and you might meet someone whose husband left them because of their faith. And now you become a companion with someone who is suffering because of their commitment to God. He says, remember that? Remember that? He says, verse 35, well, let's do, just go, go verse uh, 34. For you had compassion on me, Paul says, in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Verse 39 says, But we are not of those who draw back into perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. He says, don't go back. This is what's happening in Sardis. They are slowly looking more and more like the world, not because they're worshiping Zeus, but socially they look like the world in terms of their morality, their conduct. And here he says, don't be like them. And what does he tell them? Remember. It's interesting that each of these things that Christ tells that church, we find other people in the New Testament telling other churches that weren't dead yet. Watchful, strengthen what you have. Remember, remember what it is to have God work in your life. Pass that on. 
I think we need to tell all the stories we can, every personal story. That's one of the things that those who have been around a long time should pass on to people, second and third and fourth generation people in the church. You know what God did for me one time? We should, need, we should tell them what the Bible calls witness. Here's what I witnessed. <laughs> Here's what God did to me. We need to tell them. We need to share that with them. Man, dying church, it's, eh. let's get services over. I can smell the fried chicken. Besides, I've heard this sermon. Let's see, it's July. Yeah, I've heard this sermon for the last 20 years. It's his July, second week in July sermon. You know, I mean, we've heard this, we just, we just go through the motions here. We just go through the motions. Remember. Remember how you... Here's what it says in, in uh, Revelation. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. Remember how you got this. Well, think about a dying church. They're not interested in sharing it with other people. They really aren't. In fact, if anybody do walk through the door, they'd all be staring at them. Do you know who that is? I don't know who that is. I did that one time in West Texas. Walked into a restaurant full of ranchers at 5.30 in the morning. Howdy. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're, they're all staring at me like, he's, you know where he's from? He's not around here. You know? <laughs> yep. And I don't have boots on, and they can tell I'm not a rancher, okay? So that's, you know, a dying church, it just new people come in. They're not interested in reaching new people. In fact, new people break the comfortableness of the funeral parlor that they attend every week. It sort of breaks up how comfortable they are. Fourth thing, people in a dying church believe in a set of biblical doctrines, but they really lack a depth of understanding. In other words, if you sat down with someone at Sardis, you would probably, uh, well, we agree on most things, but they lack a depth. And the reason they lack a depth is because they no longer hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. I mean, really hungry. Not just one day of fasting, but three days of fasting. Really thirsty, where your mouth is like cotton and you can't hardly breathe. He says, when you want God's Word that much, when you want God's righteousness that much, that's where we should be. In a, in a dying church, they, need, they see no need for that. They arrive somewhere, I don't know, about 1993... Or 1973, or 2003, whenever they arrived, they arrived. And they no longer hunger and thirst. And so, they believe they have all the spiritual nourishment they actually need. They believe they have all the spiritual nourishment they need. And they do have some. But it's not a vibrant church, so they are dying, and they're dying from malnutrition, spiritual malnutrition. What is Christ admonished? How does He admonish those people? <laughs> hold fast, grab hold of the truth. Hold it. You're losing. It's like slipping through your fingers. Grab it. Hold it. Don't let go of it. It's just slipping away. And pretty soon, they don't even know what they really believe. They just don't really know it. And the fifth problem and solution to a dying church, people in a dying church are very comfortable in their complacency. They are more concerned with personal comfort 
than personal conviction and growth. They like a good sermon that really gets up and slams anybody else. <laughs> well, let's hear a sermon against Sunday keepers. Well, that feels good. Let's hear a sermon against gay marriage. Well, that feels good. Well, let's hear a sermon against uh, why you should pay your taxes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not paying my taxes to Obama. That doesn't feel good. That, that, that really was unnecessary. In other words, they're very comfortable with correcting other people, but they're so complacent. This is different than Laodicea, by the way. This church is dying. They're just... I thought about just getting up and saying, well, I was going to give you a Bible study tonight on a dying church, but hey, I don't care. And just walk it away. <laughs> they are so complacent. You know, they don't do the big sins. Oh, I don't commit adultery, but me and all the ladies get together after church, feed those men that fried chicken, and we sit around and we talk about other women for an hour. You know, you go look up someday what the Bible says about slander and gossip. It's pretty scary what the Bible says about slander and gossip. Old and New Testament. Pretty scary stuff. Oh, but yeah, but you know, we're not breaking the letter of the law. But there's this decay in all other levels of their lives. So that it's just the motions. It's just habit. It's not like I'm... <laughs> First Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. Here's what Paul writes to Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica seems to have been a pretty solid church in some ways. Not like Sardis at all. It had its problems, we know from 2 Thessalonica, Thessalonians, I mean. But 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. Let's don't go to sleep here. It's like hyperthermia. You know, what happens when someone's got hyperthermia? You keep them awake. <laughs> Go to, you know, one of the things we had to learn at, at winter camp. When they're that cold, do not let them sleep. <laughs> because they're dying if you do. You have to keep them moving. They don't want to move. You have to keep them moving. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to repent. We are to repent. How do you not become part of a dying church? Well, the five things he told them, you will find these five things throughout the New Testament told to Christians. Be watchful for the return of Jesus Christ, the sign of the times, and how you are in relationship with God in preparation for Christ's return. Strengthen what you have. Strengthen it. Remember what God has done in your life. Remember your calling. Now, some people say, well, I don't know. I was born in the church. I wasn't called. Yes, you were. You were born in the church. Go talk to somebody who wasn't. <laughs> Remember how God put you here, how you got where God wants you to be. Hold fast. Don't let go of the core teachings that God has given you. Don't let go of those core teachings. 
or you'll start to get off in the craziest stuff. There's a lot what we don't know. But what we do know is what God has given us for salvation. What we do know is what God has given us for salvation. Hold fast to that and repent. Repentance isn't a one-time experience. Repentance is a lifestyle. We are repenting all the time before God. So let's go back to Revelation 3. Remember, Sardis has a name. It has a reputation. If you went to talk to the people in Laodicea or Philadelphia or Ephesus, they'd probably say, oh, wow, you'll like Sardis. That's a good solid church there. And they have the best fried chicken after service. Verse 5. Verse 4. Let's go verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name for the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This message isn't just for Sardis. It's for every church. It's to keep any church at any time into sliding into that state of being. You know, I said, what causes a church to die? Sometimes a church dies because it's time. Christ builds a church. He calls people into it. It does well. It grows. And it reaches some lifespan where He decides not to call anybody else into it. A church doesn't always die because of, like Sardis does, because it spiritually dies. I mean, I know churches that have died out, and yet the last people there were still incredibly loyal to God, incredibly dedicated to His way, to the truth, to serving others, to sharing the gospel. But it was just time. I mean, I can't find a reason except Christ would have said, okay, that's enough. You know, I mean, if you think about it, Philadelphia doesn't have anything wrong with it. But there is no church, big church in Philadelphia today, Church of God. It's mainly Muslim. Oh, I mean, there's Christians there too, but it's mainly Muslim. Did, did, I don't know what happened to that church, but I know what happened to Sardis. So we have to realize and we have to think about a church can die because it lets itself die. It gives up living. It actually gives it up. It gives up living. And so that message goes out to every congregation, every place at all times. And it goes out to people who will be alive at Christ's return because they're going to be shocked when He shows up. And it goes out to a time in the past when this was the common state of the entire church of God. So remember the message to Sardis. We have just a couple minutes, so any questions then about what we covered tonight? Next, next time, it'll be uh, the message to Philadelphia, which is a very interesting one in the lesson to, or the uh, message to lay to see it. Two of the most fascinating messages of this group. So, anything else about Sardis? Okay, well, we'll pass out the test. And, uh, <laughs> okay, thanks for coming out. And, uh, Next time is it, when is the next time, Mr. Myers? Two weeks. Two weeks? Okay, next time is in two weeks. Okay. Thanks for coming out.